the presentation. Um, so I hope you'll give me a tiny bit of latitude. This has not been in, as entirely polished or practiced as I would have liked. Um, so I should say something about who I am uh, and why I'm even here in the first place. Um, so I'm a computational cognitive scientist or depending on which part of psychology you're from, a mathematical psychologist. And these are two terms that have a relationship to each other which is very similar to that between statistics and data science. So I call myself a computational cognitive scientist when I want to look cool, and I call myself a mathematical psychologist when I want people to think I'm smart and not talk to me. Um, and it works really, really well. Okay, so most of what I do in my... Uh, everyday life is I do teaching and research and my research is mostly focused in, on human learning, reasoning, decision making um, and so on and I build formal models of how people do that kind of stuff and I'll talk a bit about that in the talk. So I have a research lab and look see we even have a website and everything and pictures and stuff um, and I think you know on the off chance anyone's interested in the slides you can find copies of everything up there. I usually post everything I can there. Um, so, to give a little bit of a sense of context to this, like somebody asked me just before the talk, um, so what part of the R community do you belong to? And I'm kind of going, well, the outside part? <laughs> um, but that's not entirely true. I think in terms of the spectrum that uh, Roger was talking about this morning, um, myself and my students are very much at the end of the uh, user analyst end of this uh, continuum. Um, and you know, while I do know how to write an R package, I can say that I've only ever done it once. And it's not really a thing I spend a ton of time doing. So what do I spend my time doing? I spend my time using, doing teaching. I teach a lot of undergraduates and in psychology, we have to teach them how to do basic statistics and I've used R as part of that. So one part of my talk is gonna talk about some of the things that I've experienced in the process of trying to use R in that context. I do research on a bunch of different things. Huh, I left the link to a preprint up there. Interesting, I don't know why. Um, told you this was unplanned. Um, the, so I use R as part of my uh, research process. I do, you know, write code to implement models, analyze data and things like that. And I'm gonna talk a bit about how some of that plays out in psychological science contexts. And of course, as I've hinted at, um, I have been involved recently with thinking about uh, our communities in my local neighborhood. So I'm uh, involved with the Our Lady Sydney group, but I think there's a bunch of other communities and organizations that I want to be uh, a part of. And I'll talk a little bit about some of that stuff at the end of the talk. So I'm trying to cover everything, which is usually a bad idea. So um, part one, uh, I wrote a textbook. I did it purely by accident. I had no intention whatsoever of writing an entire introductory statistics textbook. Um, I don't even consider myself to be that much of an expert in the topic. It just sort of happened. Um, and the process of accidentally writing a book may be slightly instructive for, I think it ties into some of the issues that have popped up in some of the other keynotes, in fact. Okay, so to set the stage for this, uh, we have to dial back the clock a little bit, not quite as far as Roger was going this morning, but we're going back to 2010, and this was, of course, a dark, grim, terrible world without Snapchat. And as a newly minted uh, psychology uh, academic, I've been asked to teach an intro stats uh, class to 300 psychology students, which is generally not uh, considered to be the prime teaching assignment. It's the one that you know, usually ruins your teaching ratings forever. Um, and I make a huge mistake. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about this. Uh, and I think I can do it better. And it turns out I can't, but it's, again, interesting to see what happens when I try. Um, there's a lot of problems, I think, in the way that sometimes we teach statistics and social science. What I want my students to be doing is thinking about data. I want them to reason about data. I want them to work with data. I want them to use the kinds of tools that we use as scientists and practitioners of various descriptions in our everyday lives. What I don't want them to be doing is memorizing commands, rote learning a particular set of script of tests that they have to do, or following especially strict rules for analysis. Um, and most importantly, because I think this is the causal variable that underpins a lot of this stuff, I want to get rid of the fear. Fear, I think, of statistics, of programming, of essentially fear of, honestly, this community, not you guys personally, you're all awesome, um, but all of the stuff that gets done here can be intimidating from the outside. And my students come in with a level of terror which is perhaps a little different to what you see in other places. 
in terms of the spectrum that Roger talked about this morning, um, we are very, very firmly in the territory here of talking about people who uh, don't care that much about the flexibility, except maybe in principle they're scared of the complexity. The thought that they might be forced to program is, you know, the source of terror in them. I mean, I'll, to put this in context, they're equally scared of SPSS. Like there's just a certain upper left bound on what, how scared you can be, and they are scared no matter what. Like, this is the whole the the problem with the rats and stats reputation that some parts of psychology have. So. I want, as I said, I want my students to be uh, thinking. So things that I wanted to have in my class that are not traditionally covered in most psych undergrad psychology curriculum is at least thinking about why we end up with statistics in the first place. So, you know, I end up spending time, wanting to spend time talking about what probability is. And traditionally, all the psychology textbooks will describe things in terms of solely in terms of frequentist probability. So we think about repeatable processes, um, and think about the objective characteristics of repetitions of experiments and so on. And that gives you one perspective on statistics that's been dominant for you know, most of the 20th century. But there's also the perspective that Bayesians tend to take a lot of the time, in thinking about um, probability as a, um, an epistemic state. So it's about the knowledge or information possessed by an agent who follows certain kinds of rules in their reasoning, right? And so probability in this case is very much about what you uh, think uh, or degree of belief you assign to different propositions, and that gives you this different approach to the statistics. In psychology, we traditionally sweep all of this under the rug, and I don't like it. Like, I understand the, the need to want to simplify things, but as I'll cover in a little bit, this causes a certain amount of difficulty for my students. We have other practices that frustrate me, um, like we teach the sampling distribution of the mean. This is a perfectly sensible thing to teach, like as an introductory statistics concept, we all need to know something about sampling distributions. But we don't teach sampling distributions, we teach the sampling distribution of the mean. And we do it solely, or almost solely, I think, as a you know, precursor to teaching confidence intervals. So the idea of thinking about what it is that we're sampling and the relationships between sample statistics and population uh, characteristics um, doesn't actually get a lot of time in our curriculum and the funny thing is like if you actually talk to the students you know which is a crazy idea um, it turns out that as long as you don't give them too much of the uh, underlying theory the concepts are not that hard like intuitively uh, students have no problems understanding uh, extreme value distributions if I point out look if I just you know they've all had their introductory cognitive abilities lectures so they've all come across IQ scores at this point and you say well you grab five people what's the largest IQ likely to be and they'll probably guess like 110 120 or something you say okay get 10,000 people what's the largest one likely to be and they very quickly work out that you know, oh, well, obviously it's going to be a lot higher, and they start realizing that extreme value distributions are going to have different properties, right? So they can understand this really well, especially when you tie it to the kinds of uh, scenarios that they care about, or the reason they're involved in psychology in the first place. It's also the kind of thing, and this is where we start getting into the, the logic for R, um, is that it's actually pretty easy to play around with these things and simulate them as long as you've got access to the kinds of tools. And there is no way in hell I am going to try and get my students to do this with SPSS. Um, I, I'm sure it can be done, but it's just not really, that's not what it's built for. Like playing around at a low level with just generating, simulating data and just, you know, typing things like that is something that R is actually very good at. So the other lecture is an I. Uh, cooked up this scheme that we were going to switch all of our introductory statistics teaching to psychology undergraduates in R. Um, and I thought, everybody's going to love this, because all of the stats lecturers, we were all on board with this. We were really dissatisfied with our status quo. And so we present this to other people. I think, it'll be fine. And, uh, yeah, you <laughs> sweet summer child. <laughs> um, <laughs> concerns were raised. We would, our professional accreditation might disappear. The IT department won't like it. It's too confusing. SPSS, is, other classes use SPSS. Other universities don't use R. Oh, employers value SPSS. Academics won't learn it, and the students will hate it. it. It kept going. I mean, the last two are probably the ones that are uh, secretly motivating most of it. And I will comment that although I sound like I'm being snide when I say things like, oh, the academics won't learn it, the academics are time limited. They know a set of 
tools and if you're going to try and force them to change or ask them to change you need to give them a value proposition and at the moment you know the one that we went for them intuitively with was hey this will be better for our students and they're going that's nice but i don't but you're going to leave me stranded you've got to bring the other academics along with you and that took a lot of additional work but the one of course that everybody's most worried about because you know large classes, if they go wrong, lead to many complaints, is the questions of how the students will do. So um, there are a lot of different things that we thought about when trying to build this class, um, but I want to focus, I'll, I'll focus on one thing, right? Just the, the simple decision of what to use as a textbook, right? And uh, it, I thought this would be an easy one to solve, but it, it wasn't. It, it might be the one that people have suggested to me a lot of times in psychology was, well, why don't you use the Discovering Statistics using our textbook by Andy Field? And I'd read his SVSS te uh, textbook, and it's useful for a lot of purposes. Definitely a fan. Um, the biggest problem I have is I did not have a time machine. Uh, the book didn't come out until two years after I started teaching the class. I might have made different decisions had I known that this was coming out. Um, but the other one, of course, is that it costs like 150 bucks at full price, and you know, um, some of my students can afford that, but many of them cannot, and I don't want them to be priced out of this. So that's a one genuine consideration I care about. The other one I want to start with is something that comes when I pick a book that I really like, right? So I'm a huge fan of uh, Introductory Statistics with R by uh, Peter Dalgard, which is, uh, I learned a ton from this book. I feel, you can see it's well loved from the coffee stains at the top. <laughs> um, so the, you know, this is, um, I think, the version from 2008, so we were we did use it for a couple of things, and here's a screenshot from it that sort of highlights the typical you know workflow in R from from the uh, era. So you've got attaching a data frame and uh, T apply to uh, compute things from it. And I figured you know okay, it didn't take me too long to work out how to attach stuff myself, um, and I figured it would be fine, right? Um, this is again I, I was just learning the basics of R myself at the time, and I didn't see what the difficulty was going to be until I started getting these kinds of errors from my students. Uh, um, my data gets attached, Iris. Um, I mean, it's not a terrible mistake, right? It's uh, the attach function is something you call for its side effects, but it does return an environment, and you can still call, you know, you can still index the stuff inside it and so on. Um, and my students had learned at this point how to do variable assignments, so trying to understand why this command half works uh, is a nightmarishly difficult thing for my already terrified students to deal with because it's so hard at this point to not start talking about environments and scope chains and things that you just do not want first-year psychology students to be dealing with. Oh, that was second year. And the point here, of course, is that I need to know my audience, right? My audience is very different to uh, what Peter's would have been with that book, and I need to be very, very careful about what I'm doing. Okay. So what I started doing um, was writing my own lecture notes, and there was no intention for them to turn into the monstrosity that they are now. Um, but the goal was just, I know what the contents of my lectures are, I know the minimal set of commands that my students will need to use to do it, I've carefully thought through how I'm going to deal with each of the complaints that the students are going to come up with, and I will just write my notes to deal with my specific set of circumstances. And so I had a whole lot of kind of design criteria when I started writing. Right? The big one, because the thing that is underpinning so much of my everyday problems here is student fear. Um, the, a good chunk of the notes, if anyone's been silly enough to ever look at these things, is just filler text. I spend a whole lot of time talking about how this, you know, why we do all of this, why are the students scared, why do we teach them things that they find scary, and just basically spreading out some of the content, like relative to books that are trying to get you up to speed as quickly as possible. This thing is long. It goes long and it rambles. Um, and that's a deliberate choice because what I'm trying to do is spreading out the aversive events. And for these people, statistics and R are the aversive events, so you actually want as little as possible in the book. Um, again, they're not irrational to do this. Like, um, so, of course, I'm aiming for a really relaxed style. There's a very clear authorial voice in the book, and you know, I come across as a bit of an idiot um, in the book. I may very well be in real life, too. Um, 
I'm obligated to, to cover a certain set of topics, so you know, you handle the usual things of t-tests and ANOVA and so on. Um, I have to, if I don't do this, the rest of the faculty will scream at me that this is just what the course has to be. But I did tweak at the edges wherever I could, and I did it in sort of ways. So like I said before, one of the things I did want to talk about is the relationship between Bayesian and orthodox inference and statistics, and part of the reason I wanted to do this is dealing with a bunch of intuitive errors that students make. And the classic one in psychology, and I suspect in a whole lot of other disciplines too, is things like when you introduce confidence intervals, people intuitively attach a Bayesian interpretation to it. So they will say, uh, you know, despite me telling them otherwise, uh, that this is an interval for which there is a 95% probability that the true mean falls inside the interval, right? And you're going, no, you can't treat a population parameter in that fashion under the orthodox interpretation and so on. But just telling a student that they're wrong doesn't help here. Not when the Bayesian interpretation is so intuitively appealing, right? Telling students instead it's right, but for a different kind of statistical inference than the one that I'm teaching you, they handle it a lot better. So just I having the concept of both Bayesian probability and frequentist probability actually made it a lot easier for me to handle a lot of the student errors that popped up on the fly because you go, yeah, yeah, you're doing the right thing, but for a different problem. When you see this thing, do the other thing. And they were less likely to scream at me. So that seemed to work. I had to cover a whole lot of topics that I never expected I would. Uh, like, so there's whole sections in the book where I end up talking about type one, type two, type three sums of squares, which is not the sort of thing I would expect to be talking about in an introductory ANOVA class, um, not for psych students anyway. Um, but the reason that this happened is dealing with uh, changeover effects. So by default, SPSS makes assumptions about how to handle sums of squares in unbalanced designs. And those assumptions are different to what R will do. It depends on which package you're using, of course. But say, you know, the defaults in, say, the car package are different to the defaults in, you know, SPSS handling these things. And oh my god, people freak out when SPSS and R do not give the same answers because, you know, they've been taught, like uh, academics as much as the students, that there is a right answer and a wrong answer, and one of these has to be wrong. And I have to tell them, no, it's not like that, right? They, they calm down, it's fine. But this is part of the calm down, it's fine. Most of the book, in fact, is just calm down, it's fine. <laughs> um, but, and as part of calming down, it's fine, like I have to discuss some interesting things like recycling rule for vectors because students will play around with things and they get weird results. Of course I have to d talk about basic data visualization. This is all pre-tidyverse so everything's done in uh, base R. The book has no tidyverse in it which is very sad. Um, so I talked about basic programming. None of the students uh, or almost none of the students ever used this. Right? This is a complete like I do not teach my students to be programmers. Um, they don't want to be programmers. It's just, there's a chapter which is left orphaned in the book that just sits there in the middle that they can look at if they want to. And about three of the students every year look at it. <laughs> but those are the ones who end up going, oh, this is awesome. And they do cool things and they actually get excited and we don't lose our best students. All of the other students, I mean, I shouldn't say best, I will say most quantitative, because we have awesome students who are not quantitative. Um, but the ones I want for my lab are the quantitative ones. Um, so I cover a bit of programming. I I went nuts. There's regular expressions in there for some reason. I think I went overboard. Um, the thing ended up over 600 pages long, and I don't know why. But so I started teaching from this thing, uh, and I think it's kind of interesting to look back. I don't teach this class anymore, um, but it's interesting to think about how it went. And there are a couple of great outcomes. Uh, it helped me. I got great student evaluations, and so I looked really good on my CV. Um, somebody gave me a teaching award for some reason. Um, and I've got a book. Yay! But that's not really what I care about, honestly. Um, I, uh, the thing that does matter is I was really, I was surprised actually at how well the students handled the core concepts. So um, the basics of just doing simple operations in R was not that hard for them as long as you took the time to hold their hands and basically point out that, no, no, everybody screws this up. Um, and they got there fine. They grasped the statistical concepts better than they had in our earlier curriculum. There are points of failure. Um, the huge one, I ran out of time and did not write enough exercises, and I think that a huge part of my 
failure mode on this stuff is just they need to see the same concepts over and over and over again in a bunch of different com contexts. And the usual one is they struggled to generalize. They really did have a lot of difficulties in working out how to solve their own problems after the fact. Like that's still been a bit of an issue. So, you know, I'm not the world's greatest teacher. I, I try. But all, all in all, I think as an exercise in trying to get started in, in building uh, a use case for R in an area where it's not traditionally been used, it, it did okay. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't be an academic if I didn't find fault in my own work. Uh, so the book has some limitations. It, uh, it was all written in LaTeX, so it's not R Markdown, and it's really hard to get all the content back out again to modernize it. There's no tidyverse, which sucks. It needs editing, etc. I can whine about my own work forever, but I maybe a more frustrating one, which I'll point out, is the constraint of, I got this paraphrased uh, criticism in a grant application a while back. An introductory textbook, well written though it is, does not constitute a scholarly work, which, you know, not pleased. Um, <laughs> but I live or die as an academic in a lot of respects by my ability to win grants. And if it's the case that this work that I'm doing doesn't have, uh, you know, if I'm spending a huge amount of time on this um, and it's no longer part of my teaching profile and nobody cares about it for grant purposes, it's no longer part of my job. Um, it's something I have to uh, acknowledge. So I can't do very much with my notes anymore. Like I don't have time to do anything more with it, but I was somewhat surprised, especially after I joined Twitter and discovered this stuff and people started tweeting to me about it. People were using these notes. Uh, they were out there and so like I had a look at my traffic on my website and it's like about 90% is just people downloading the book. <laughs> um, so I eventually decided, okay, the solution to my problems is I'm just going to throw it out of open to the world, so it's now up there. If anybody finds anything useful in it, feel free to just grab the bits, use them yourself. And there are other people I know who are sort of doing that with adapting it to new purposes and uh, you know, writing their own stuff based on it. And so hopefully some of that is useful for other people. And that at least makes me feel happy. I tried something uh, that I thought was likely to fail. It did okay, and I think it's helping within my discipline uh, a bit, which cool. I'm really pleased about. So that's part one of my talk. That's how I use R in teaching. The other thing that I do is use R as part of my research. Um, I, as I said at the start, I'm a mathematical psychologist slash computational cognitive scientist. It's always interesting to see how these things render on different screens. Um, this is obviously Bayes in uh, characters in the background. Most of the stuff that I do is um, looking at how people learn, reason, and make decisions in complicated environments. And probably, may maybe as a surprise to some people in the audience, like psychology has quite a long tradition of computational modeling that goes back even to the you know, mid-15th century. Like if you ever go and read um, Stephen Stickler's History of Statistics, you know, the measurement of uncertainty before 1900, which is awesome. Um, there's a whole chapter devoted to psychophysics and memory stuff that, you know, like, um, basically Gustav Fechner, who's a big name in you know, the history of psychology, actually basically invented probate regression on his own. I don't know if anyone else had done it, but that was pretty cool, I thought. So I'm going to give a few examples of recent projects that I've done. Like this is the part where, oh, it was a sudden talk that came out of nowhere, so I'm just going to grab stuff from other things. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the role that R plays within them. So the first one uh, is uh, an example of human reasoning uh, using Gaussian processes. So for those who come from a machine learning background, like Gaussian processes are probably fairly familiar. We've got stochastic processes, all of which, you know, any fa over an infinite number of variables, any finite number of them are jointly Gaussian, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, they're used typically for, you know, solving regression and classification problems. My daughter uses them to teach herself algebra, apparently, um, which I thought was very cute. Um, but so the usual idea, for those of you who don't know, is that you s it's a Bayesian approach typically uh, where we would say, look, we've got some prior over unknown functions. You, get, you receive some training data. You update this to a posterior distribution. And so you learn about what underlying function exists in the world. And this has been used in psychology before as a way of looking at how humans learn unknown functions. Like there's a whole literature on function learning. The way that I'm using it here is as a model for inductive reasoning, and the idea is something like this. So we typically talk, in, when we talk about machine learning, you talk about training data and test data. Well, here's a really simple problem. Um, 
it's an inductive reasoning problem. I give people a very small training set consisting of two observations. I tell you, sharks have plaxium blood. Seagulls do not. And so I'll skip over a ton of methodological details that you wouldn't care about unless you're actually a psychologist. Um, and you then give them a test set that might include a bunch of observations. You give the original ones again to find out whether they really believed you. Um, but you also have all of these generalization examples. So, okay, do goldfish have uh, this property? Do penguins have it? And so on. And effectively what you end up with then is, you know, some kind of density estimate you know, for the property defined over a multidimensional space. There's a whole lot of technical things under the hood, but this is my five-year-old daughter trying to explain the core concept. You know, so yes, sharks definitely have it, so they've got a very high probability according to the function. Seagulls definitely don't, so they've got low probability and got other things in the middle. Uh, she was very helpful in preparing this talk. Um, under the hood, so what you typically do then in this context is you'll implement this in something like JAGS or STAN. This is me doing it in JAGS, you know, so the syntax is very uh, R-like. And so you'd say, okay, so here's a Gaussian process prior from which we assume that we're sampling some classification function. Um, and then from this, the learner in my experiment is presumed to receive some data. And what they're going to do, and uh, there's a reason I've snipped that part of the code out, um, I'll get to it in a second, but we treat it basically human learning and classification as kind of an inverse probability problem. So it's a form of Bayesian reason reasoning that humans do. Um, so what we do experimentally is we just manipulate a ton of different things, all of which pertain to what's the relationship between the classification function and the data. And you manipulate all of that kind of stuff and people will give you different answers. For the purposes of this talk, since this isn't really a psych talk, I won't tell you all of the different factors that we're manipulating, but here is the sort of data that you get from it. Like these are just generalization curves where you know that the thing on the left has the property, you're unsure about the things on the right. And so you do a bunch of experiments and you get data that varies quite systematically. I mean, this is sort of averaged over the responses of hundreds of people, which is why we get nice smooth curves. But you get the sort of sense that people are doing something really systematic. And the really nice thing is when you go and, you know, uh, apply the Gaussian process model, it basically reproduces all of the same patterns that humans do. Like, people are actually surprisingly good at this kind of inductive reasoning problem, at least in the sense that Gaussian processes imply. You can see that the model's not perfect in the sort of fourth or fifth panel along there. You can see a model failure on uh, the bottom there where it, there's one experimental condition that it just can't capture. If you replot all this as scatter plots, it's surprisingly good. Like, I don't usually get model fits that well. Um, and there's very little parameter estimation that's going on in it. Um, there's but you have to do robustness analyses to make sure that you know, you're not overfitting your data, et cetera, et cetera. Take it as read, I hope, that I know how to do these things. Um, perhaps for this audience, it's worth then bringing this back to the question of what role does R play in all of this? Most of it is the usual things that we teach, right? So the data tidying summaries, figures, modeling, R markdown, and I'm using it to call JAGs, and honestly, I use uh, R as my model for JAGs. I just assume I'm writing R code <laughs> most of the time. Um, there's a couple of other things that are a little bit more idiosyncratic, like um, I'm basically using all of the string manipulation stuff, so regular expressions, to manipulate the underlying JAGS model so that I can say that in this condition, we're going to specify a different JAGS model to that condition and just build it inside R, rather than writing a million different JAGS models. Um, so, and of course, I implemented my own just customized robustness analysis for uh, the model, which was badly written. My code is usually badly written. That's one application. And I think the kind of model for how I've used R in this context is pretty similar to a data science sort of model in so far as R comes in after the experiments. Here's one uh, where another project, um, R plays a slightly different role, but first we'll talk about the project. Um, so in real life, people have to solve sequential decision-making problems, right? So what I choose to do now affects what I'm going to choose tomorrow. And the dumbest version of this stuff is, you know, like bandit problems, where you have something like four options. So you can imagine that they're slot machines, or they could be coffee shops or restaurants or something, uh, different conference stream sessions or something. And if I pick one, I can't pick the others, uh, and it'll yield some kind of reward. So I'm just going to pretend that they're slot machines. And I pick this one, I lose $5, I pick that, I win two, I go here, I lose one. And now I've got a decision to make of, am I going to try out the fourth one or do I go back to the second one? 
right? This, apparently, I'm going to go back to the second one. I lose some money. This is a kind of explore exploit level. Do I want dilemma? Do I go and explore and learn something new, or do I go with something that's worked in the past? And this is a problem that's studied a lot in a lot of different disciplines. You can see it in machine learning, you can see it in statistics, in psychology. I discovered today while wandering over to the adjacent conference, there's a, a par it's in animal behavior. In fact, I knew it was in animal behavior. I was just surprised to see that, you know, exploration as a behavior in sheep is a thing that is also studied, right? Which, yay. Um, so the particular task we were looking at is one where, well, what happens when people are in competition with each other or if there is a threat to your set of options? So I've been betting on these machines before, and because I haven't been using the other ones, someone's taken them away from me. And there's a whole separate literature on how humans are averse to losses, um, and there's a, there's a whole literature on, on that kind of stuff that I'm not going to go into. You may know some of it, but what we wanted to do is see exactly what role that plays in these sorts of tasks. So it's something like this. Like this is a sequence of choices, and you can see that when I leave options alone, those options disappear. They're no longer available to me. I won't go into all the methodological details. Um, I just spent a whole lot of time trying to argue with neuroscientists over this, uh, and um, I don't know very much about neuroscience. Um, but uh, this is what the task looks like when people are doing it. This is obviously sped up a, a bit, but you can see people are choosing options. Options start disappearing when they're left alone. Um, I'm getting rewards, skipping the one in the middle. And here the environment changes on me right at the end, and so I start getting very poor payoffs. So you can look at how people solve this problem in a lot of different kind of environmental distributions. It's typically modeled with things like Kalman filters, which are you know, often used in some kind of AI kind of context. But again, I won't skip. I'll skip over the details other than this is the sort of thing that if you take AI or you know, statistics classes or you know, things you'll probably run into, um, this is something where the model is built into the task from the very beginning. So we've got an R, I wrote my own pretty rubbish uh, implementation of Kalman filter models in R, and it was extremely useful to have this written before the experiments were designed because I used it to motivate a whole lot of my experimental settings. So working out what kind of environments, what kind of dynamics are involved, how long should I have to wait before options were taken away from my participants inside the task, all of that kind of stuff. I could actually make those design decisions by using this R-based implementation of my theoretical model. And it wasn't mine, Peter Diane, I think, uh, had this implemented in neuroscience many, many years before I was playing around with it. But it was a super useful thing to have in this instance. Anyway, so you can go and run a whole bunch of experiments. Again, we'll skip over things. This is the standard version of the task, which is usually done in, you know, that, as it is typically done in neuroscience across lots and lots of conditions. Basically, human, the fact that that sits on this nice diagonal line, human performance mirrors that of the Kalman filter really closely. Again, you get great correlations. When you put people into this situation where I steal options away from you, you see a slightly different pattern when you compare human performance against the Kalman filter. Again, you see these really strong correlations, but the um, intercept has moved, or the slope has moved. There is a systematic pattern of deviations where humans make worse choices than the Kalman filter in this task. Um, and there's a question of why. Um, and this is a whole, th there's a whole separate line of research on like why does this difference exist. But what I will point out is that uh, it's super systematic. So this is basically a plot showing the difference between human performance and the Kalman filter in different kinds of environments. Plotted on the x-axis here is a function of how strong the threat to this option actually is. So how close is it to somebody taking it away from you? And what you see is that's a fairly systematic trend. That's a fairly systematic trend, and that is as well. Um, there's a pretty clear signal here that we can use then to develop new models to work out exactly what's going on and how people handle threats to their options. Um, there's something clearly systematic um, going on in all that. I've hidden one data point, uh, for those of you who are noticing, that's, you can ask me later if you care. Um, so, to bring it back to R, because this is an R conference. What role does R play in this context? So again, we see all of the usual sorts of things. I use it for my data analysis, for drawing pictures, and things like that. 
But here, this is something a little closer to the model that uh, Bill Venables was talking about in his, his talk, right? This is something where, although I am playing both the role of my data analyst and the, the, the scientist, you know, um, uh, my use of R as a modeling tool is integrated from the beginning. My design choices are built uh, from thinking about the kinds of formal analyses that I might do at the end. And that really shaped the, the way that I designed my tasks, and that was a really, really important role. And this is a sort of situation where, yeah, you, you, I needed that in there before I started doing any of the empirical work. Okay, number three. Uh, my third uh, little example. I include this mostly for uh, fun value, but this is something where I'm like, um, dealing with... Well, I'll just explain the concept now. Uh, free association is a concept that has existed in psychology for a really long time, right? You know, so here's your ink blot test. What does it make you think of? And you think of something like, I don't know, a bat, a butterfly, I don't care. Um, the sort of thing you're probably a little more familiar with, right, is the sort of examples of, you know, I, I say coffee, you think tea. I say cat, you think dog. I say R, you say stats, etc., etc. right? There are automatic associations that exist between one word or another, and, you know, people go back, this stuff has it goes all the way back to Freud, who seems to think there are deep meanings to these things, which I disagree with. But they tell you something interesting about the structure of language. And the trick to making this interesting is to scale it up. Don't ask one person, ask 90,000 people. Don't ask about two words, ask about 12,000. Don't get a couple of responses, get four million. And this kind of thing, when you combine all the responses from all of these different things together, you can get a semantic network which is being visualized as a hairball here, as they always are when they get to this size. Um, that tells you something about the overall structure of the lexicon in English, right? And the color coding here actually tries to highlight the fact that uh, there is global structure to the human semantic network. Um, and I forget what variable we're plotting here, but you can see that there is structure to this network. So this kind of thing is super useful in psychology for a bunch of different purposes. Like one of them came up in Bill's talk again, so I'm going to grab it. I grabbed his thing from uh, like you know gender uh, stuff, so the Lara Boroditsky stuff about um, uh, can you know, the grammatical gender influence the way that you think about this sort of stuff? Well, one uh, thing you can do uh, using this kind of data is actually get a, a, a different kind of measure of the relationship between words, right? So we have here basically a, a paper where we're going to um, measure the associative structure of the English language. And we've done it in other languages too. We did Dutch first. Hopefully this will load. Yes. Okay, so this is... Uh, Simon's the one who did all the work on this, so this is on his web page. But if I want to go bridge, feminine, let's find out. I'm very excited. Okay, it turns out they're not closely related to each other in English. Um, so you have here, um, the, this little word cloud is basically showing the structure of the semantic associations that people automatically produce between these things. You can do the same thing with masculine if you want. Uh, it turns out statistics and fun, not closely related, which I was very <laughs> disappointed. Uh, at discovering, um, but this kind of data is used for a bunch of purposes in psychology. So, um, move forward, there we go. Anyway, of course, you get this sort of data, you, this is all the boring stuff, and it's like, you know, we've got to benchmark it against other things, provide some historical concepts, show people that I'm smart by including an equation, uh, but you can do fun things with it as well. So you can do, uh, and this is, I, I go back and forth between whether I think this is trivial or interesting, but we have, um, what you can do using this network is say, well, imagine then uh, you want to ask people to assess the similarities between quite different concepts, roses and cars versus houses and clouds. Which pair of these things is more similar? And I genuinely have no idea what the answer is. I'm, I'm actually curious. Who thinks that cars and roses are more similar than houses and clouds? Come on, hands. And who thinks the other? Okay, take a quick, you know, I hope most of you actually just saw that, but there is an amazing degree of consensus on this. Then you ask people afterwards when you, do, I didn't actually know which way that was going to go, incidentally. Um, when you uh, do this, there is a surprising amount of consensus. And then you ask people their reasons why, and they don't agree. Like, people give lots of different reasons. Um, we, and when you try and get this stuff through the review process, reviewers are convinced there are reasons. So you have to go and run tons of experiments and test all of these reasons, and none of it works. Um, so 
we had this dumb idea then, we'll just try and model it as spreading activation through these semantic networks. It doesn't work when you use these tiny uh, little networks, you know, as they were being drawn in 1975 based on people's intuitions. But when you use the real thing, you can actually make predictions about this. And I won't go into all the details, but to my surprise, it actually kind of works. I mean, not anywhere near as well as, you know, I'm not getting correlations of 0.9 anymore, but we're getting systematically uh, strong correlations between just, you know, stochastic processes over this graph and the judgments that people make. Um, and it even tells you something about exactly what processes might be uh, going on in the brain when people do this kind of thing. So that was a super fun project, and I partly wanted to mention A, because it's fun, but it's also the kind of data that people here might be interested in. Okay, so in this context, what role does R play? This one's a bit different, and it's mostly due to m it's my limitations. So it was super useful at the margins, again, for the usual reasons. I can use it to draw figures, I can do my linear modeling, and with the experimental studies, it the smaller scale stuff, it's fine. But here, I, my skills just break down. I don't know how to do big data in R. I know, you know all the stuff about having to hold the, the data set in memory is now you know, running up against my limitations. And I know that there are tools that you can use to get around it, but I don't know how to do it. So you know, um, this is something where you know, I start needing help from people who know this stuff better than I do. So that's how R plays out in my research work. Um, and I, those two parts of this talk that I've given so far are kind of disparate to each other, right? So I had this thing about learning uh, introductory statistics with R and then a whole bunch of stuff about doing psychological research with R. And you might notice the tool sets seem to be somewhat different to each other. So this does create the problem of, yes, why though? And this is a sort of you know, summary of a few different conversations I've had with colleagues over the years, um, but I'm just going to put words in other people's mouths as we go along. So the cast of characters here is me, a cognitive psychologist with some experience in R. We have uh, a friend uh, of mine, a grumpy psychometrician with a very limited time budget, who refused to have her picture shown, so she's a possum now. Um, <laughs> and uh, Lisa, a social psychologist who wants to believe. Okay. Um, and the conversation goes kind of like this. So this is this is me on Twitter in, in real life, and I've decided, you know, I've fallen behind the times in R. I learned base R ages ago, and I want to learn all this cool new stuff that's going on, so I'm just tweeting about stuff I'm learning. Like, I'm trying to force myself to learn new things. And so my friends say to me, cool, what have you learned? And my answer is, I can add cat gifts to a plot. <laughs> <laughs> and Lisa's response is, why? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she admits it's cool. She, she, she's, you know, the real Lisa is extremely nice. Um, she has given me permission to uh, distort her uh, views a little. I can draw pretty maps and, uh, and so on. Lisa's response is, why? <laughs> I don't care. And again, it's not useful to her. Well, I can model associative learning as Bayesian inference over an inhomogeneous Markov random field. Weirdly, I find myself alone in the room after this. <laughs> um, this is, but this is highlighting a really serious problem, right? And it's one that most of us sort of know. There's the stuff I teach to my undergrads, there's the stuff I play around with on Twitter, and then there's the stuff that I do in order to get published in academic journals, and the difficulty curve on this looks more like a cliff. Um, and it's pretty forbidding to new users, right? They want to see, how can I use this for doing something other than what I already know how to do, from my undergrad stat classes, and not just stuff that is fun on Twitter. And there's not always a clear path for people to work out how they're going to get there. And it gets complicated. This is a little tendentious, but I'm going to say it anyway. So this is a real conversation. Um, how do you feel about posting your code to the web? Well, no. People will call me stupid. And, and this, the person I'm talking about has literally what, written books on statistics and won awards for her papers. But her code is ugly. It's really ugly, right? And it's ugly not because she's dumb, but she's operating under crazy time constraints. She has to get code out in 20 minutes for clients to get things out of the way. And I have similar constraints, but for different reasons. And research code, when it gets archived, is always really, really bad. And it's not because we're dumb. It's not because we're not trying to learn. It's just that 
uh, we're operating under constraints that make it hard for us to write really nice code. And honestly, I can take it. You can be mean to me. That's okay. And, you know, my friend the possum is also kind of like, meh, I don't care. Do what you like. But when it comes to interactions with our colleagues who are just, you know, we're trying to convince, you know, she would not, Lisa would not be, uh, it would not be unreasonable for her to say, I'm out of here. I'm not dealing with this stuff. I can read Stack Overflow too. I have read this stuff and it's not always very nice. And it does matter. You do drive away people who ought to be part of our community um, by looking for bidding. Um, and I know that that's not actually how people think. I have met people in the R community. You're all lovely, right? So there's just a sense in which um, there's a, an appearance which is a little wrong, but it's always nice to remember things, you know, be kind. Um, everybody is fighting a hard battle. The code that you see is written under unknown constraints. And, you know, as my five-year-old daughter's classes, in a world in which you, where you can be anything, be kind. And this is something Lisa just forwarded to me this morning. It popped up on my twi Twitter feed, but I'm going to point this out. Um, so this is just from Nature Human Behavior. I guess it's just come out. But small, consistent, pro-social acts are subtle signs that sustain long-term cooperative re relationships. And that's a big part of building communities, constantly just being a little bit nice, a little bit kind, remembering to take a little bit more time to be, you know, to recognize that other people don't have your training, haven't had your opportunities. That kind of thing builds really, really powerful communities, and it's what causes groups of people to stick together when solving hard problems. And data analysis is a hard problem. We all know it. So, okay, I can, you know, Lisa knows this stuff. She's smart, so she comes back, and we continue the conversation. And I must be getting very low on time, so I will point out stuff like you can make the case to social psychologists, social scientists, psychologists, that they should be in this room, that they want to be part of this community. They want to do R, right? And there's a whole lot of tools that they love. We know that they're there, right? This has been in R from the beginning, and a lot of this is really quite usable these days. Um, but then, you know, but there's elements of uh, practical difficulty that people have, you know, like trying to work out, well, if I've got to learn something, which packages am I going to prioritize? How do I move an entire lab across? I've got students. I've got a whole b group of people around there. I can't do this. And how's it going to play out in the review process? And this does lead people to some slightly difficult situations. If you are alone and you don't have people around you, the CRAN task view, so this is psychometrics, just one part of psychology, packages, 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 packages. If you don't know what you're doing uh, and you don't have the people around you, this is an awesome resource. I love this. For me, this is great. Um, for somebody who has done barely more than you know, their graduate level social science classes, this is terrifying. And of course, this is only one of the task views. This is the extremely useful thing for me for uh, social science stuff that John Fox does. And I, uh, again, great resources for me, but there's a sense in which it is too much complexity at this point for some of the people that I want to convince to come on board. So, you know, we just say, yeah, ignore that, just pick the first one, do something. Um, migrating a lab across is a more complicated thing than just one person. I mean, most of us have worked in teams before, but the issue of me learning stuff, I might teach myself base R, but I'm surrounded by grad students, postdocs, fellow academics, and they use different tools, right? So most of us might be using base R, but not all of us are. There are a whole bunch of sort of related tools, some of which are in R, some of which are not. I use some of those, but not others. The people in my lab use some of them and not others. And now we've got this complicated, uh, you know, we have dependency hell here. <laughs> um, so bringing new tools into this mix takes a fair bit of uh, work and expecting people to make the change quickly is unreasonable. Not that, you know, I expect it, but I think giving people who want to make these switches the, um, the right, well calibrated expectations helps. So for me, this is a kind of instructive thing to notice, that there's actually hidden structure to this graph. The people over on this side of the graph are people who were part of my lab at the University of Adelaide, and we were entirely in our land over there. The people on this side of the graph are in my lab uh, at UNSW, and the students here have started out in MATLAB and are kind of gradually migrating across and learning new things as they go. But this is two and a half years in. I've been at UNSW for two and a half years, and overall, the integration is modest. Like, there's still quite a lot of progress required to move a whole bunch of people across. 
and making sure that the people you're you know, proselytizing are to understand exactly what that process looks like is kind of useful for stopping them getting disappointed when it turns out to take freaking forever. So the final thing I want to do on doing this, just because I'm an academic and I like to whinge about reviewers, um, but, you know, there's a, there is a, a point to be made here. So I try and do something fancy. I, I'll do this in R or some other language, and I do, I do something clever. And a reviewer tells me that I have to do a dumb thing instead. <laughs> I do a different thing that is clever, you know, I have, and a reviewer tells me to do something that is dumb, right? I use something that I think is clever. The reviewer tells me that I have to do something that I think is dumb. <laughs> now, I don't know if I'm right in, or I'm wrong in this sort of situation, but, um, you know, I don't think that my choices are necessarily any better than anyone else's. I don't think I'm smarter than other people. but. One of the things that happens in this process is that you go out of your way to teach yourself a new tool, you do the thing that you think is smart and that everybody is telling you is the really the right way to go about this, and then you kind of get you can end up getting met by some surprising amount of hostility in the review process, which is also kind of disheartening at times. And the way, you know, Lisa might put it is to say, well, okay, so it's a long way to the top of this cliff. Somebody might try to push me off, and my peers might not respect me for making the effort. You are making the world's worst sales pitch for R. Um, and she's right, I am terrible at sales, but um, I exaggerate, of course. None of this is that bad. These are little frictions. They're not, none of it is uh, fatal, but this is kind of coming back to the point about community. Um, it really helps to climb with a team. Like when I first started learning R, I was the only person I knew using R, and when something broke, I had nowhere to go, and I made mistakes, and I got people yelling at me when I did the wrong thing, and it was really disheartening. What I, try, what I do now is I find I surrounded myself with people, other people who are trying to learn the same thing, and so having a team, having people who can tell you, uh, this is where I refer to another of the keynote speaks, but uh, talks, um, is uh, having a community of people around you has value to you as a learner. And it can tell you, you know, exactly how to wind your way through the, the, the paths, teach the things that you need to learn, and avoid, avoid the dragon. Do not, you know, uh, feel like you have to know it all. And that, but that's a thing that often I think newcomers feel like I need to know all the things, and they're never going to know all the things. So having this team around you, it's hard to find enough people around you in a, in a single applied field, which is kind of why I like having lots of organizations. Like They can be small, they can overlap in lots of different ways, but just having groups of people who come together to kind of lead each other up the slopes is a really important thing, I think. And there will be people to support you. Know, for me, I get a lot out of being involved with our ladies these days. Um, the R open science thing, I think, is just fantastic. Um, I have high hopes for the rainbow R thing, but just in general, I've got to say, R stats Twitter has just been magnificent. Like, this is a huge thing in my life that has kind of invigorated my desire to go and learn new things because everyone on there is really nice. And that's those small, constant, little pro-social activities that do a lot to bind us all together as a community. And I think that's something that um, really does matter a lot. And I'll stop there. Danny. So it may not surprise you to hear that Danny and I only met in person uh, just a few weeks ago when we launched Our Lady Sydney. And I just feel so grateful. So Lisa, who was a, a starring part of this talk, and Jen, who's been watching the whole thing on Twitter, are the other founders of Our Lady Sydney with Danny and I. And I'm just so excited about our future here. Now we have a couple of minutes for some questions. I could think we could probably take one or two if anyone's got one. You guys are all ready for coffee. <laughs> uh, yes? Absolutely, go for it. Excellent question. Um, so I'll, I'll have a go at this. So yeah, the question is basically about, well, essentially, why didn't I talk, talk about Tidyverse? Um, the main answer, honestly, is that I'm a late convert to, convert to Tidyverse myself. Um, and it, it, this might be 
useful to comment on slightly in that the way that it happened, right, is I taught myself R. I learned a whole bunch of stuff in base R that it was well before tidyverse. My students, my PhD students, uh, were, they all learned later than I did, and they started sending me code with pipes in it, with, you know, dplyr and all this sort of stuff, and I didn't have time to look into this, but it looks really nice, and they, so they're all tidyverse converts, and I've only just later come into it, and I find, I do like tidyverse a lot, um, and I think if I had my time over, I would probably look at building a similar set of tools and a similar curriculum to what I did, based more around tidyverse, or at least using a lot more tidyverse concepts. Um, but, you know, um, I'm, I have a kind of an element of vendor lock-in that's got, you know, where I'm the vendor, but I wrote my <laughs> notes without having tidyverse, and now I have to go over and rewrite it. But, um, again, that's part of this thing of it, it does take time to, to move a whole ship around. Um, so, yeah, I'm a bit slower than, um, than most on getting on board with tidyverse, but I do think... From the experiences that I've seen indirectly, my students do tend to do better at learning the base, basic concepts of, in data analysis with tidyverse stuff. Um, I haven't yet had a... I don't have a large enough sample size to say anything about whether or not I think that has any consequences for their subsequent learning of uh, programming uh, concept. Yeah, right. I, I, I don't know. I'll let you know if I ever get data. Fantastic. Well, I think we're headed for two o'clock, so I think that's about coffee time. So thank you very much, and thank you, Danny.